Welcome to NASDAQ Trade Talks, where we meet with the top thought leaders and strategists in emerging technologies, digital assets, and regulatory landscape and capital markets. I'm your host, Jill Malandrino, and joining me on the desk at the NASDAQ market site is Matt Fitzpatrick, CEO of Invisible Technologies, Ted Krentz, CEO of Interos.ai, Avanish Marwaha, CEO of Latera. We're here to discuss the AI adoption gap and how businesses should navigate risk tied to global AI development. It is great to have all of you with us. Welcome to Trade Talks. Let's go around the horn here quickly. Matt, we'll start with you, where you sit, Invisible technology sits within the AI ecosystem? Sure, we are a, uh, an AI and data platform company with verticalized applications in insurance, food and beverage, public sector, and asset management. Um, we're also one of the market leaders in what's called reinforced learning human feedback for AI training. So we work with all the big model builders to actually help build their models. Yeah, and Ted, welcome back to the show. Give us a reminder. Thank you, Jill. So supply chain risk intelligence, we map and monitor the global supply chain. Catastrophic risk, cyber, ESG, geopolitical risk, finance risk, regulatory risk, all within a platform. Right. And Lutero? Uh, we're a software company focused on legal industry, 100%, uh, bringing workforce solutions and uh, mission critical technologies and leveraging AI where it makes sense. So when we talk about the adoption gap, Avanish, I think we need to acknowledge the elephant in the room, that these systems, they're complex to develop, to deploy, to maintain. So I think we should start there. It definitely is a maintenance part of what I find very interesting. You know, we build, we, we leverage the models that exist and then you can fine tune them over time, right? So. We can release a piece of technology that solves a problem for, let's say, a lawyer today, um, and the competition may come out with a, a, a fresher model on top of it. So, in this race we're in now, in the constant refinement of the model and making sure that we're getting as close to perfection is pretty important. Uh, and that's something that I think wasn't contemplated initially, like how much work goes into uh, obviously the first release of a product, but the ongoing maintenance of it to make sure it still maintains really good results is, is pretty. Yeah. Uh, important. And Ted, part of the challenge is too, organizations lack market data. Absolutely, well it comes to our business supply chain risk. Most of these Fortune 1000 companies, we estimate 481 of the S&P 500 are doing it in-house with manual systems in place. Mm -hmm. So without mar market data view, it's hard to manage these risks that I talked about. You, you've got to have some type of market context to evaluate that risk. Matt, what are you hearing from CEOs and senior leadership? Are they happy with their AI strategy? You know, I think one of the challenges, despite all the excitement in the news, the, the rough data I see is somewhere between five and eight, eight percent of AI projects actually make it to production and use. So you have about 92% of them effectively dying on the vine. And then the other stat I've seen recently is 94% of CEOs are unhappy with their current AI initiative. And I think there's an interesting contrast there where the, the technology innovation and the progress has been substantial, but I think it's just actually adoption has been harder than people expected, and that's really been the challenge. I also think part of it too is you have to have a use case for it, not to yes. deploy AI tools right. for the sake of doing it. There needs to be a problem to solve, and uh, you know I also think there's a misconception out there that AI has been around for a long time, right? I mean, it's, you know, it's the 60s, 70s. It, it's been around, um, whether people are aware of it or not. So it's like this rush to get things to market that perhaps there's no use case for. Yeah, yeah, look, I mean, I think a lot of the, the change with the large language models is the interface in which you interact with AI has changed, so people are a lot more excited about it. The reality is we've had 20 years of, of AI really transforming the way society works, like take straight through processing of mortgages. That's really changed the way people can get home loans. It's very positive for society. But we have not really figured out how to operationalize Gen AI in the enterprise yet, and I think that's what society's grappling with. Yeah, I also think, Avanish, if you have any disruption at any stage, that can throw things off, you know, for a project entirely. 100%, I mean, we, you know, we roll out technology, especially in a highly regulated industry like, like legal, mm -hmm. um, you know, any misstep in the analysis or output of that, um, that data set could be meaningfully disruptive to uh, the briefing, the court filing. So to gain that trust takes a, it's a high bar, I think, to get over. So uh, I'm in this mode now where you tell a law firm or a lawyer, you're gonna invest in technology, you just can't invest in it once. You have to come back to it over and over again to see the evolution because it may have been wrong the first time, but the second time it might be right. Uh, so that, that, that's pretty hard of a change motion to put in place for places that are just used to buying something that works. It's the widget, it does its right. job, you move on. But now that you put a brain on it, it may not be right all the time. So you've got to get used to adding um, consistent review to make sure you're not making right. big mistakes. I mean, but Ted, that's essentially the baseline when it comes to data, right? It, it's not just something you you know set and forget. Right. You're constantly monitoring your, your governance, you know, looking for the vulnerabilities, how to mitigate any risk, how to respond to it. So it, it's a continuous tactical and, and strategic exercise. Yeah, yeah, for us, you're talking about 350 different data sources, some public, some private, mm -hmm. 10 terabyte system to build the global supply chain and more notably, 
not just your tier one suppliers, but that tier two, tier three extended supply chain visibility. 90% of the Fortune 1000 have almost no visibility into that sub tier. Yeah, and you know, Matt, you brought something up interesting in your notes as well. The, the, the training sprints are much shorter than they have been in the past. Yeah, I think you know, as models have evolved and we've seen so much progress over the last couple of years, I think you've moved from longer, kind of simpler training into a lot of like a lot of the topics people are training on: advanced computer science, physics. These are things of, of much more complex topics with PhDs, and that, that's a lot of our. So our agent pool is an example. It's 1% acceptance rate, mostly masters and PhDs. And wow. I think that's a lot of what we're seeing demand for is those types of experts in short sprints on really specialized topics. Right, and those are the kind of experts that rely on back testing. Yeah. And, and going at short sprints is not necessarily within you know their DNA. Yeah, look, I, I think one of the things that, that a lot of folks have struggled with is like, what does the definition of good look like in a model, right? right. And like, there's a very clearly statistically validatable way to think about that in, in machine learning, which is you back test it, you show mm -hmm. kind of error to the curve or actual statistical improvement. And that, that, that basis has not really existed in the same way in Gen AI to date. And really the only way we think you can do that is with reinforced learning human feedback right. and what you're saying. And so we specialize in actually spinning up experts on any topic you can think of to actually solve that problem. Yeah, we actually have in-house large law firms, uh, like, like um, legal teams that review our work before it hits the market, right? So you've got to continue to refine internally before you go to market with these technologies because you don't want to show up to a specialized user and not have a refined uh, model behind it. So. Yeah. There is a, a decent amount of expertise that goes over an existing model to make sure it works for a verifice. I think one thing we were talking about earlier, I think there's a hope that, the, or a, kind of a market expectation that this will be a SaaS solution right. that mm -hmm. you'll be able to just push, push a button and it'll work, and it is not going to be that. I think to get these models in a way where you can trust, like I bet my bonus that this model will work in the enterprise, you're going to need to do proper heat reinforced learning, heat feedback, you're going to actually need to do validation, and I think that's what the market is adapting to. Yeah, especially with these ERP systems, big procurement supply chain systems. DeepSeek got a lot of recognition for its reinforcement learning, but for these enterprise systems, you're going to have to have humans in the loop to tag these right. suggestions so that they are high quality enough fidelity-wise to send to ERP systems of record to do predictive and ultimately prescriptive right. execution. Well, I mean, you need human in the loop from a regulatory perspective. Right. That's true. Exactly. So you, you can't get around that. I think part of the challenge, um, Matt, you alluded to this, is that there's several um, operation environments within an organization. Things are very siloed, right? Yeah. So if you're with that fragmented, that makes it challenging as well to optimize AI integration. Yeah, so so I think there's two reasons why Gen AI has not taken off. One is we were just talking about the, the feedback and definition of good, but the second one, what you're getting at is data. And so if you think, you start with the paradigm that 70% of the software in America is over 20 years old. Most of it is terrible, like that is an unfortunate reality. So if you're the average business, as you're saying, you've got supply chain systems, ERP systems, you have branch databases, all of that is fragmented, none of it talks to each other. And so I think, you know, I, I have a joke that when uh, when when good AI meets bad data, the data usually wins. Like if your data is not organized and structured, there's no way yeah. you're getting right. useful. Yes, and 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 Avanish, I think prioritizing data modernization efforts, um, thinking about whether it's cloud standardization, oper operationalizing all of this. That's that's the key to it. Yeah, and it, it's been fun to watch to some degree, but also frustrating. You know, we took 20 years to go from desktop applications to cloud and legal. It took 20 years for that journey <coughs> to occur and now they want to rapidly use Gen AI, their data is not ready for it, right? They have to do large 12 month projects for data memorization, do the right taxonomy, so that way you can actually go do the work. So even though they want the tools, they want all the things around it, unless they actually prioritize their, their data, call it data lake or infrastructure in the right way, it's almost invaluable to even start using Gen AI. Right, well you have to make sure that you have the right skill set for it as well. I mean, if you don't have you know, th the workforce that's able to execute, but, uh, you, you know, law firms, that's typically not their first not their thought. thought. Um, and perhaps not every industry has to move at the same pace. That's right, I think that's right. I think, you know, uh, it's a hot topic right now in legal because of the, the amount of data that exists with documentation and histories of legal findings and proceedings and contracting. That's a great spot to apply some intelligence for future predictions, uh, but it requires a lot of things that didn't exist, right? There weren't data scientists sitting in law firms. There weren't these yeah. key roles. There weren't anybody, there wasn't innovation sitting in most of these law firms. So. Um, while the excitement's there, I, we've got a long way to go. It kind of reminds me, Ted, with this rush for everyone to migrate to cloud, and now you're starting to hear where it's somewhat moving back to a hybrid environment so that you have yeah. some on-prem yeah. and you have some cloud. That it, That's a little bit of a concern. If you move everything to an AI environment, um, I, I think you might see the pendulum come back 
to a certain percentage. Yeah, for, for us, and you mentioned this earlier, right, we're a market data provider for the world supply chain and knowledge mm -hmm. base. But you've got to synthesize that data with your own data, your own supply chain procurement data. So for us, a pass through with like clean rooms makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. so that you marry up those data sources and then also additional data as a service elements that might be vertically oriented or specific to you that you want to tie into your scoring to draw down your risk proactively. Yeah, we were talking about this off camera too as well, Matt, from a startup perspective. Yeah. The technology is moving so fast. What we're talking about now might not even be the new thing in six months to 12 years, uh, uh, six to 12 months. Uh, makes you think, you know, from the entrepreneur startup perspective, what's the right place to be in? I think one of the hardest things about this is the enterprise has very clear needs, but a lot of the signal that new startups are building off of is effectively eight engineers in a room kind of on the strategy they think is going to be useful and you know, it might take a year to build something commercializable and bring out. And so I do think one of the challenges so far is a lot of the people most best equipped to build that technology don't have clear links to the enterprise. And I think that's one of the things we're really focused on is building exactly what the enterprise needs in very specific ways. I think that's one of the challenges I've seen is just kind of a lot of the verticalized applications. Right, and, and Amnesia goes back to what you were saying before, perhaps not understanding what the business needs, That's right. right? So if you have a room full of designers and engineers and they don't understand the nuances of, of what's required from a legal perspective, what are you designing for? That's right, right? And, and so we've had to leverage, in the last, honestly, last two months, we've pivoted our business to have internal, almost like startup mentality, because we want the energy and the excitement of a six person team in a, in a, in a garage, but the safety <laughs> of enterprise uh, you know, business. So by having these small incubation teams that can run almost untethered to the rest of the business, but have strong product management on top of it, put all the right requirements over that so that way they at least build for what the, um, the client uh, ultimately wants, it helps us get to market faster. Mm -hmm. Because to compete with the startup, I think right now it's, it feels kind of easy because we, we, we're enterprise grade, we're safe, we're secure, uh, and we know what they want versus someone who's just building in a garage. Right, but you also have the expertise when it comes to data, right. privacy governance, cyber governance, what that framework could potentially look like with AI, That's you know, right. if, it, if, it, if it's, you know, built around what we currently have with, you know, privacy and data That's governance. Right. Being global, right, we've already, we already indexed for GDPR. Right. And so one of the comments we made, maybe you just find the most strict global uh, authority around AI and say we're gonna apply that across our entire platform and that way force maybe some regions that aren't as aggressive on their AI protections that we're just gonna put you in that model because at least meets all of our standards right. globally. So we're, I think we're still early stages of figuring out what that looks like. Uh, and Ted, I think that makes sense. Why reinvent the wheel and then have to do it again and again? Yeah, and again. yeah, yeah. No, the point here to kind of index to the most strict requirement makes a ton of sense. Like even for us, Doge came out with 180,000 pages of US regulatory issues alone. For us, in terms of the regulatory oversight, as you mentioned, with supply chains globally, that's a big component that has to be automated. Otherwise, you'll have no purview into ensuring that you're compliant. Yeah. Do, Matt, do you think the macro environment could potentially impact innovation and, and companies moving forward with their strategy? I think people are aware of the, aware enough of the potential AI that I actually still see a lot of desire. In fact, I think a lot of the enterprises have a lot of dollars planned to invest in it. They haven't really been clear what to do with it. And so I actually think, it, you know, if you took whatever's being spent now, I think the answer will be more in the years ahead, yeah. but a lot more focused on what mm -hmm. the outcomes are. Yeah, I, I just feel like there's been such a rush for internal and external product applications with AI. So I'm thinking in my head, okay, cyber, right? Yeah. You know, what are the implications for that? We haven't had the time to back test that and what it looks like. And, and look, we're humans, right? It, it, whether it's um, malicious or not, humans make mistakes, right? And it's so easy for, you know, vulnerabilities to be exposed. Right, and, and when you're rushing to get all of these platforms out there, perhaps that wasn't the forethought. Like, you know, um, cyber by design might not have been the forethought. Yeah, look, I think, um, I think kind of AI governance and regulation is a very good thing. I think mm -hmm. if you take like, again, machine learning, because we talked about it, there's been a large, the last 10 years, 20 years, the banks are, the banks have to go through model risk management. They have a lot of validation they go through that makes sure when they roll a model out, it works. Mm -hmm. I think you'll see a similar form here. And I, I think that's a good thing. I actually think the worst outcome would be you launch a model that has a really bad public outcome that endangers either the enterprise or its customers. Yeah, well, what about interoperability with all of these different AI operations? So I think of it in a couple ways. One is between the systems itself, but the other, like in our industry specifically, if a lawyer does something, right, they, they create a they draft, and it's a model inside their law firm. Once it leaves their ecosystem and goes to the opposing counsel at a different law firm, you could be arguing against different models and not understanding what the actual language is you're arguing over. But that could happen even inside own, their, own law, uh, their own law firm, right? So if my data set as a partner is what we use to train my work, if I'm using the IP attorney next to me to help me out, mm -hmm. their model's different. At the end of the day, this could cause a lot of waste of time. We're thinking efficiency gains, but are we really getting them? So 
there's going to be some ways of working through the models working with each other in the back end is going to be an interesting thing to think Which about. is going to be interesting because you might start litigating the efficacy of the models right. themselves, right. <laughs> not even like you know the, the base of the case. Are, are you seeing the same thing too when it comes to supply chains as well with interoperability? Yeah, for sure. I mean, just to give some context, like you're talking about cyber strikes, right? Mm -hmm. The CrowdStrike Microsoft combination. Our data showed there were 670,000 companies at a tier one level impacted globally. Like the scale and magnitude of these risk scenarios against the supply chain, as well as geopolitical concerns right. heating up, this is going to become a bigger issue for the Fortune 1000. Yeah, well, I mean, you also learn from these mistakes as well. I mean, where was the failure in terms of redundancy, as an example, right? right? So that might be another factor when you're thinking about implementing these types of technologies. Um, as we're rounding up here, Matt, what do you think we'll be talking about in the next three to five years as it relates to AI? What, what's, what's gonna be the outlier and, and what's really gonna work? Yeah, I'll actually hit on the topic you just mentioned, which is now interoperability. I think that the last two years have been about e kind of extrapolating a traditional software development paradigm, SaaS, to AI. Right. And it's not gonna work. Like, I think if our founder has a joke, if there's an app for everything, how come nothing works? I think that is actually true so mm -hmm. far. It's like, there's a hundred point solutions. If you're a CTO, you're sitting there, they're like, this is exhausting. How do I get to actually solve my problems? And I think what people are gonna realize is, this will all be about interoperability and tools that can layer in together on top of Snowflake, on top of Databricks, that, that can sit in your system and solve problems, not just be a closed architecture SaaS platform like the last one. Yeah, Avanish, I would think that one size fits all approach is, is naive. I mean, who would expect that? Yeah, it's not, it's not, it's not tenable whatsoever, right? Because there's different practice. I was talking to someone, you've got region specific work, you've got um, different size of firms, you've got different type of work types, right? You got uh, IP, you got trust in the states, you got all these different things that fall into it. There's no way one singular solution can solve all those problems or make them uh, more efficiency gains. So you're gonna have to really tailor this to the market end user. I joke, is there a world in the future where a partner and associate has their own individual model? Because essentially, if you leave a law firm, go somewhere else, who owns that model that you just built at a firm? Should that that should be yours in the Isn't US? Isn't that like agentic AI-ish? It's a little bit. It's more like you know, if I train a model based on my client's data set that I've been working on for ten years, and I'm the partner, and I leave, and my clients come with me, does that entire model move with me as well, mm -hmm. or does it sit with the firm I was just at? And in the U.S., we would say it should go with you, right? Uh, yeah, it's almost like if you make the analogy, if you leave, you know, one warehouse and you go to the other. Yeah. Right, you know, how, how do, what, what does that structure look like in terms of bringing clients or, or models with you? That's nothing new. Yeah, on the enterprise side, I think the hybrid dynamic that will play out is the combination of applied AI, big data machine learning models with contextual AI. Contextual AI might be better suited for workflows and you know, research assistant supporting the human user where the applied AI is really com combining all the data sets and driving those predictive insights. Yeah, it'll probably come down to copyright in IP, you can't copyright your clients if you're going from a different broker to another broker, but you can copyright the the technology though. You could, but yeah, then the line is like, where does, what is your IP versus the model's IP? Right. And who actually paid for it? Like, it's, it's going to be an interesting conversation. This, this has been one of the biggest, again, one of the biggest challenges with adoptions, what you could broadly call hallucinations. Like, what is this, like, to what degree do you have IP violations? Do you have mm -hmm. you know, bad answers you don't expect? I think that's been one of the things that people have to figure out over the years ahead is the exact source and validation of any model produced output in the enterprise. All right, appreciate everyone's insight. Thanks for joining us on Trade Talks, and thanks for joining me from MarketSite. I'm Jill Malandrino, Global Markets Reporter at NASDAQ.